our next keynote speaker who in his own words is a digital nomad a hacker who travels around the world out of a backpack and a laptop he literally does so as we witness on his instagram exploring the world in his running shoes skates ski boots cycle scooty surfboard actually anything and everything he could lay his hands on a travel enthusiast a fitness freak a fine chef he's ranked in the top 20 in hacker one and has won the mvh most valuable hacker title for the latest hacker one live event h1303 let's hear it with a huge round of applause for yasin abukar hello everyone uh, thank you so much for having me here today uh, it's really an honor to be invited to talk about uh, besides ahmedabad this is my second visit to india uh, i was here first time during the nolkong in goa in 20 2019 if i remember i had such a good experience so it's really nice to be back here thank you so much for having me uh, so i was thinking about like the topic for today like i was just thinking what should i talk about should it be technical or non-technical or just something in between because it's like that just like heather mentioned like there were no guidelines to what uh, to talk about but like since a lot of you here are probably uh, there you're involved in the back bounties so so do I, uh, I uh, I'm also involved so I I thought naturally probably people will expect me to talk about that topic but like today it's not gonna be about how to get started in back bounties because I, I think they're gonna be another panel later on but I'm more gonna talk about how you can actually step up your back bounty game or how you can like develop or build this top tier back bounty hunter mindset so you can find more cool, uh, cool and impactful bugs when you're doing bug hunting. But before we, we get into it, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Yasin uh, Abukir. I go by the same username Yasin Abukir. Um, I'm originally from Morocco. Uh, I'm based in France uh, and I, I I'm a business major. Uh, like I think a, a lot of you here probably have different backgrounds when it comes to uh, studies. Uh, same for me. I, I come from a business background. I have two master degrees: one in corporate finance and the second in management of information system. That was pure management stuff. Like literally, no computer science or anything. That means that if you're passionate about something, you can do it regardless if you got a degree or not. I've been involved in application security consulting for uh, a little over a decade right now. Uh, I, I do a lot of pen tests and secure assessments for uh, uh, companies. Uh, I'm also involved in back bounties. I've been doing back bounties since 2013. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, I'm one of the Hacker One Top 20. Uh, I recently, this year, I won the MVH, the most valuable hacker at the live hacking events organized by Hacker One in Denver. Uh, that's me there, uh, holding the belt. I look like a UFC fighter. I know that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And a lot of you pro probably know me by my avatar on uh, Twitter. I use the goat. Don't ask me. I just love goats. Uh, yeah, so I'm also an ex-hacker. I, I, I worked for HackerOne for a while, like probably two years, uh, from 2017 to 2019. That was such a very interesting experience that I'm going to talk about later on in the slides. And I've been traveling almost full time for uh, over four years. Uh, I started in 2018. I've been to a bunch of countries, including India, as I mentioned earlier. So probably 40 countries. And yeah, that's it. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to talk about how I got into back bounties. So as I mentioned earlier, I've been always passionate about security since a young age, probably 15, 16 years old. And I, I loved finding security bugs in software just for the fun of fi finding those bugs. Uh, I wasn't doing any back bounties back then. Uh, so what I was doing was kind of, I, I love to call it irresponsible disclosure versus this, uh, responsible disclosure. So basically, I, I was finding security vulnerabilities in software, and I would just post them publicly on exploit uh, databases, which is that's not the way to go about it because like you have to coordinate with the vendor before you actually post it but i was just i don't know probably doing it for clouds i don't even know what i was doing so these are bugs from 2011 like a bunch of sql injection uh, cross site scripting authentication bypass uh, so i was just posting everything on exploit db but then uh, later on i was reading a hacker uh, 
an article, news article about this company called HackerOne and how you can start actually hacking legally without risking to go to jail and you still get paid for it. I was like, oh wow, that's interesting. So I went straight and signed up on HackerOne, right? This is, this is, this is HackerOne back then. It was a really crappy interface. Uh, so I signed up on this platform, but I couldn't really figure it out. There were like a bunch of open source projects like Django, Python, and all that stuff. I didn't have the skill set to actually uh, do any code analysis or anything. So I just let that go until later on, on in 2014, uh, uh, there was Yahoo program on HackerOne. It, it got launched, and I gave that a try. I gave it a try, and I started looking for bugs on Yahoo. And luckily, I got one lousy bug. It's really bad, not, not that good. But like, this is uh, the bug that I found, my first bounty, to be honest. Uh, I managed to reset the, count, the vote counter. So Yahoo has a suggestion board where any user can post suggestions, and other users can either upvote or downvote. And I was like, OK, so when you click on vote, you just like, there is a parameter called vote value, and it just adds one or minus one. So I was like, what if I just change it to 1,000, right? I just did it like in the con browser console there. So I changed it to 16,000, for example, and I clicked on vote. And what happened is just the vote just got reset. As you can see here, it was like three, 357 votes. And I, when I just did that, like I put 6,000 and click on vote, it just reset the whole thing. That was the bug. <laughs> Seriously, it's quite a lousy bug. but. Yahoo actually accepted it. I submitted it in February 20, 28th, uh, 2014, and they were like, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to accept this, and they paid 400 bucks for it. I was like, wow, that was my first bounty. I was like, holy shit, I can actually make money doing some hacking. Is this real? I, I did not believe it until I actually got the money in the bank. So I was like, okay, we can, we can keep doing this. So uh, it was, uh, I, it was uh, summer of 2014. I just finished university, so I had plenty of time. And I just went ahead and I submitted a lot of bugs. Any kind of bugs you can think of. I read people disclosure and I just keep submitting. But that was low quality stuff. And I got so many not applicables. Holy shit. That journey was really bumpy and frustrating. I did not expect it to be that difficult. So I got rejected for various reasons. The first one is like lack of security impact. I would submit a bug, but there was really no security impact. It was just that, an informative, basically. And sometimes out of scope, I just go out of scope. I don't even respect the scope. That's bad. Please don't do that. Uh, or maybe false positives. Sometimes I don't understand the application very well. And I think, oh, that's a bug. Whereas it is not actually a bug. You just need to understand the app. And that's, that's it. it's just working as expected. Or poor communication. My English back then was not perfect. Uh, it was still good, but not perfect. But also, I did not know how to write good reports. I was missing details, no POC, uh, impact statement was not on point. So I got rejected a lot, and I felt really frustrated, especially back then there was no reputation system. So companies just closes any just like that. And what happened is that, boom, Hackron was like, we're going to introduce the reputation system. I was like, OK, I'm doomed because I've got so many NAs way back before the reputation system. And what happened with HackerOne is that when they set up the reputation system, they applied it to all previous reports. So I've got all, so many NAs, and a, a lot of these companies just close it an NA, even if it's an informative, because there wasn't much education around the reputation thing. So I, my, 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 my reputation got ahead, actually. Uh, so as you can see, but in 2015, like one year later, I still made it to top t top 100 at HackerOne, but with a horrible signal. That's one like 1 1.6 out of 5. That means that the signal actually said, means that how many valid reports that you submit, right? So that means my signal was bad. That means a lot of my reports were, were bullshit, basically. Not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. So. Fast forward one year later, in 2016, I, I kind of managed to make it to HackerOne's first live hacking event. It was the very first official one. It was in Las Vegas, H1702. It was quite an interesting experience because like, I was surrounded with some of the top hackers that were invited from different locations in the world. And it was inspiring. But it was also a humbling experience. But the imposter syndrome felt so strong, just like Hitler mentioned. Like, during your career, you're always going to feel it to some degree. You just have to know how to manage it. Because, like, 
there will always be stuff to learn. So I felt the imposter syndrome be surrounded by the top hackers there, and also with my bad signal, like, whoa. Um, this is when I realized that uh, in that life hacking event, I realized that I need to improve. I need to step up my game, right? I need to improve my uh, testing methodology, find new techniques to actually step it up. That's right after H1702, uh, I went with this mindset of finding like cool bugs and just like cut the bullshit. And I found my first RCE. Uh, it was an image magic vulnerability, very uh, straightforward. So I got my first RCE, it was critical, and they paid 3K for it, and I was very happy about it. And I, I, I just love this new mindset that I'm starting to develop, like looking for impactful and cool bugs other than just sticking to low hanging fruits. So fast forward to 2022, 20 uh, my signal here, my all time stats, I managed to improve my signal. It's now 5.20, it took a while actually. It took a while, but it was worth it. The impact is still, uh, uh, is still good. I could improve that as well. Uh, reputation points doesn't matter. In the last 90 days, just like past three months, I've been invited to a bunch of life hacking events. So my findings were more impactful, like I was more focused on finding impactful bugs. That's why you can see that my signal was, is, is good. It's seven out of seven, which means all the reports that I've submitted were valid. Uh, I got a solid impact as well. And that, was, that took a while to improve, actually. But it, all it took is the change of mindset, like uh, changing your mindset from actually focusing on low quality stuff the, to actually looking for good and impactful bugs. All right, all right, let's step back a, a bit. So I managed, uh, uh, I mentioned that I worked for HackerOne, right? So I was part of a HackerOne triage. You probably guys familiar with it. So when I joined them, uh, HackerOne was quite an interesting experience because as a bug hunter, I, l I learned a lot from it. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I did learn a lot. So what I did uh, as a triager is I was working as an interface between hackers and companies. So basically, we would receive reports from hackers. I do the validation, the proofreading, and everything, and we pass, pass it along to the team, to the, the company. So we managed big programs. We, we worked with the US military. We managed Spotify program, Adobe, PayPal, Slack, you name it, all those big companies. That's why it was interesting. And we received a lot of garbage reports, just like the reports that I used to submit. It was, was, it was a very, a lot of spam, honestly, like uh, false positives, informatives, and, but there was always a few selected people, they would always submit good stuff. When I say good stuff, it's like very good bugs, very impactful, amazing reports, well written, good, uh, in clear impact statement, POC, reproduction details, but we would always remember these guys. As triage, we would remember them. So every time they submit a report, we're excited to triage it because we know it's good stuff, right? And, and that's why it's important to actually uh, focus on submitting good bugs. Uh, and I also noticed that a lot of people, uh, they submit the reports, but they don't have good understanding of CVSS. CVSS, we, it's a standard that we use to uh, assess the severity of a vulnerability. It, uh, it's the industry standard. But I, 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 what I realized working for HackerOne is a lot of hackers, they don't know how to use the CVSS. So they either submit reports with very inflated severity, like it's a low bug, but they submit it as a critical. That's very typical, right? I did that too. No, no judging. And yeah, like understanding CVSS is actually important because that these people are missing out on a lot of uh, on, on bounties. Like for example, when you find a bug and you're very familiar with CVSS, you want to like double down on like hitting all the components of CVSS. You want to like uh, demonstrate impact that you can impact confidentiality. You want to demonstrate that you can impact integrity, availability, and minima minimize the uh, complexity or just uh, get rid of user interaction so you can actually increase the impact of your bugs. So understanding CVSS is very important. Also, a lot of triage frustration originates from poor and unclear communication with back bounty programs. Just like I mentioned earlier, a lot of hackers, they submit bullshit report. Not bullshit reports, it's just that it's not well written. Either like the English is broken, so you might want to like step up your English because it really helps a lot. Or just like the way you write reports. Like, do you include a good description, a good summary? Do you include POC or like reproduction steps, a uh, clear impact statement as well? So it's very important to know how to write good reports. 
And keep in mind that every organization has just a different threat model, which means that uh, like a high severity bug for a company is not necessarily has the same severity for a different uh, another company because it's just they have a different threat model. So when you get paid, like for example, uh, for an excess is as high on a different program, do, don't expect the other program to pay similar similarly. It's like it's just different. All right, let's talk about some common bug hunting methodologies. Like from my experience as a triager, just like as a hacker collaborating and talking to other hackers, I realized there are like almost four how bug hunting methodologies that I could I could I, I could observe. The first one is the full automated and unauthent unauthenticated. There are some people they automate everything. They bar they barely do any manual hacking. Uh, like everything is just authenticated. But most of mostly it's unauthenticated. Like they have templates. It's just random on different programs. But they don't do anything. Everything is just uh, automated. And there is the full manual. Some hackers they love just focusing on the app and just doing everything manually. Like no scripts and no tools or anything. Just like get down and hack that app. So this is the full, I, I like to call it the full manual, and the 50-50. That's me, 50-50, which means that I like to do like half of my work. Uh, I, I do it automated. I do a lot of recon automated. And once I have all that data, uh, I start doing everything else manually. Like the every, all the testing, I do it manually. So that's why I call it the 50-50. Most people do that. And there is the zero day, zero day all the things. There are some people they love to do security research, and what they do is just they go and hack these softwares. And they find zero-day vulnerabilities, and then there are a lot of bug bounty programs that you probably use that vulnerable technology. So the, these guys, these bug hunters, they just go and uh, test the O-day on all the bug bounty programs. It, this pays a lot, actually. And so these are the four methodologies that, that I can think of. And the natural questions that might come is, which one is best, right? Which one is best? I don't know. <laughs> so actually, all of them have proven to be effective, to be efficient. Why? Because there are people who have proven that. I'll give you an example. All right. The full automated, I'm, I'm not very sure about this, but I think, I think it, it's almost accurate. Full automated and unauthenticated. I can give the example of Eric. Today's new. He's doing a lot of automations and he's doing it successfully. He's made millions out of it. So that means it works, right? And there is the full manual. Ron, he loves to hack apps. He doesn't do any automations. Just like everything is just manual, understanding of the app and so on. And there's friends. Friends loves to do some automation. He does a lot of automation, but also a lot of manual testing. So it's just like everything is like 50-50. And it works. Friends is a, a legend. He has made good money with that methodology, I guess. So, and there is Shops. Shops loves doing code analysis. He loves finding zero-day vulnerabilities in software, and then just test that zero-day across different bug bounty programs. So, all these bug hunting methodologies actually work. It's just like mm, some of them might be more efficient, more effective than the others. For example, the full automated, unauthenticated, that requires a lot of costs because you're going to run so many servers in the cloud. So that might be very costly. Also, some cloud providers, they're going to block your access most of the time if you're running brute forcing or heavy scanning. And, and such, or just like the full manual, like it might take a lot of time to actually find bugs doing that, doing it manually, because like you have to spend a lot of time, invest a lot of time and effort actually understanding the application. So it might take a while to actually find that vulnerability. So like all these methodologies actually work. It's just like the, each one of those have like pros and cons, right? And it it's up to you. It depends on your skill set. All right, this is just an example of like how you go about bug hunting. For example, let's, let's assume that you want to make 100K in bounties, like probably three months or six months or in one year. I don't know. It depends on your goal. How do you go about it? Would you actually go and find 200 bugs, a low or medium, to get like each bug 500? 200 bucks is a lot just to make 100K, right? I mean, some people could pull it off. It's easy. I mean, if, you, if your goal is to make it in one year, you can do that. Or you can find 100 bugs. Each bug is like 1K, but it's still a lower medium. Still a lot of reports, right? You have like the spam programs with some bullshit just to, ma to make it your goal. Or you can focus on finding impactful vulnerabilities that will pay much more. And just like, suppose that you submit 20 bugs. Each of those are medium and high. 
and each one is 5K, which is very standard payout for like a mature back bounty program. Or you can find ten, only 10 bugs, high, focus on only high and criticals, and each high and critical would pay, for example, 10K and you already made your goal, right? I think the middle ground is the best way to go about it because you don't spend, you don't spend so much time like just submitting bullshit, also not less frustration. And what I think is a top tier bug hunter, from experience, will always try to maximize the returns with the minimum reports because they are aiming for impact. You're aiming to find critical and high security vulnerabilities so you can maximize your returns with less reports, with less bugs submitted. Uh, right. So as I mentioned, uh, the middle ground was pretty good. So uh, as a top tier back bounty, you want to focus more on like criticality, on actually proving impact. So you want to focus on P1 and P2 bugs. These like P1 and P2 uh, means like P1 stands for critical bugs and P2 stands for high security, uh, high security vulnerabilities. Critical is usually server side bugs, like maybe an RCE, SQL injection, XXE, SSRF, authentication bypass or high severity bugs where you, maybe you can access only user data, but that's still bad. Uh, so like, I'm not saying that you should skip on finding low and medium vulnerabilities, definitely not. If you come, if you're testing the app and you come across those bugs, just submit them. What I'm saying is that you have to go with the mindset or just the goal of finding impactful vulnerabilities. Like when you start hacking on an app, just focus on finding P1 and P2. That will take some time to find those bugs, but it will pay a lot in the long term, trust me. So why do you want to look for P1 and P2? First of all, you avoid duplicates and related frustration. Because a lot of, if you submit like mediums and lows, a lot of people submit the same stuff. So you always end up with so many dupes. It's, and it's, I know it's a frustrating experience when you find a bug, but it's a duplicate, someone beat you to it. But when you find P1 and P2, I don't think there will be a lot of duplicates. First of all, because you get quick triage and resolution. When you submit a critical to a company, they have to act on it very quickly. So your report is triaged very quickly, and it gets resolved super quickly. You get paid easily. That's another reason. And high monetary rewards, like P1, P2, they pay very well to get good bounties. And another thing is that you want to hack on healthy and high PN programs. Well, when I hack on, when I when I don't try to choose a program, I always go for this. Like I check the bounty table. For example, this GitLab. This is their bounty table for high severity bugs. They pay between five and fifteen k, which is decent. And critical goes twenty, thirty five k, which is pretty good. These are healthy program. This is Shopify. Shopify is paying up to one hundred k for one bug. So basically, if you can find a very good critical, you might get the 100k I talked about later, uh, earlier. You can just get it with one bug. But it might take a while. It might take some time, right? But it's doable. Uh, all right, talking about high pain and healthy programs, most of the mature programs, they, they display their stats, their health stats. This is from HackerOne, different platforms. They also have uh, stats for programs. So on HackerOne, like before I start hacking on a program, I check the average time to acknowledge my own report for this. This is PayPal's backbounding program. So they take four hours to, f to give you the first response. And the most important one is how much how much time until I get paid, right? That's the most important one. So PayPal, for example, they take 18 days. I think that's, that's okay. It's not bad. Uh, also, look at different program stats, like uh, average bounty that, you might, that is getting paid, the top bounty that was paid, and you might get that. Or there are some numbers there. So PayPal, they have like 1,470 bucks that were fixed. And for a, a regular bug hunter, when they see that number, there's like, oh, no, no way that I could find anything on PayPal. There's like, oh, 1,000, that's too many bugs fixed already. Am I going to find something? That's the regular bug hunter mindset. But like a top tier bug hunter, that doesn't matter. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Because like they know there are so many changes that are, ge are, are getting pushed every day. So many, so, so many code changes that every day there might be a vulnerability that is being introduced, right? So those numbers do not make a sense. It should not intimidate you. If you see 1,000 bugs fixed, you might still find a lot of bugs. And that coming from my experience, because I've been to life hacking events where we had a, like very big programs, very mature, like they fixed so many bugs. And then you see these top hunt bug hunters, they find criticals. Like how do you do that? 
that means because there are always like changes, there are always like vulnerabilities that are being introduced without the developer developer's knowledge. So it doesn't matter. These are some programs that I recommend that you might hack on. They pay very well. They have good stats, good time to good response time. TechTop, Dropbox, Epic Games, GitHub, Reddit, Instacart, Stripe, and Uber. Uber just got hacked, but they still pay good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about some in-depth reconnaissance. OK, so unlike what is common, uh, like reconnaissance is like a, a trending word. Everyone is just keep talking about it. Reconnaissance, what do you do? Reconnaissance. But what is commonly taught is like people have this wrong idea about reconnaissance, that it's only about finding subdomains. That is very incorrect. Reconnaissance is a broad word. It's about acquiring information about the target, any kind of information, any way. So it can be like DNS, finding DNS information, port scanning, uh, services, fingerprinting, anything. It's just not subdomains uh, enumeration. You have to change that idea. And like my, my kind of uh, reconnaissance that I love, it's not about subdomains in, uh, reconnaissance. It's about rec doing reconnaissance on the app itself. So if the, if the core app is in scope, I love to recon the app itself. And how I go about that is I usually go and just do some automated or manual spidering of the app. I, I log in as a regular user, and I just click on everything. I submit every form. I create, I create other forms. I just use it as a regular bug hunter, uh, as a regular user, and I capture everything in history in the, in using the proxy. Or I just use Burp Suite Crawler. Uh, it helps a lot, especially if you want to automate it. And then you have uh, like this, you can just visualize all the assets or all the architecture of your app. You can visualize it on Burp Suite, for example, when you go to sitemap. So I love doing that so I can have a, uh, a global view of what I'm hacking on. So one thing I, al I also do is like context uh, adapted word list. A lot of people here, when they do fuzzing, brute forcing, or anything, they just use generic word lists. Like you download a word list and you use it all on all the targets. Uh, but that's, that's not the most effective way to go about it. You could actually customize the word, word list to fit the, your target. Uh, you, can, you can do that. Like, uh, uh, or you can just, like, for example, go on Asset Node. They have different word, word lists for different technologies. So let's say you're hacking on a WordPress target. You might want to use a, a word list that is like, specific to WordPress uh, software or installations, right? So, Another one is to expand the scope and attack surface. Like, I'm hacking on this app. Uh, it's very limited, but I want to expand the scope. I want to acquire more information. How I do that, I look at the company. Do they have some other software applications? Do they have a, a browser extension? Do they have a mobile app or a desktop software? If they do, I go and decompile it, reverse engineer it, and just look at the source code, find hard, juicy information that will help me hack on the core on the core app that would might that might be like uh, sound like going out of scope but it's always like just to acquire that information that will help you actually hack the main app that is in scope this is my favorite thing to do when i do reconnaissance javascript files these are super good when, when I'm hacking on an app, uh, as I said, I just browse it as a regular user and capture everything. And then I go and check all the JavaScripts that were being fetched by the app. Because these JavaScript, they have a wealth of valuable insight and leads. Because they, they could have endpoints. They could have parameters that are not visible. Uh, they could have hard-coded credentials. I've got those a lot of times. Expired domain names that you can clean and achieve a certain impact or post message mix configurations. So what I just do, for example, I go on Burp Suite, and I just filter by all, show only JS files. I copy all the links. I feed everything to Link Finder, very good tool. But, uh, and Link Finder just scraps all the endpoints for just JavaScript files. That's one way to go about it. But I also do a lot of manual inspection of these JavaScript files, because you might miss a lot of stuff. You might miss hard-coded credentials. A lot of companies, they just put their credentials in JavaScript. That's, that's really weird. But like, Java, like doing reconnaissance and reading JavaScript is very important. And it actually pays well. This is one of the bugs that I found during a live hacking event. Uh, so this bug here, I found it thanks to JavaScript. A lot of people missed on it. And they paid 22K for it. So I don't know how, 
like the the mistake that a lot of people did is I don't think they 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 read the JavaScript all the JavaScript because I could I managed to find that endpoint the par partner connect I found it in the JavaScript file, and I navigate to it and I realize that I get redirected to entertainment.redacted.com with the access token. So this company is authenticating me to a different service uh, using that endpoint. So what I realized is the path parameter was vulnerable to open redirect. It was a simple B pass, as you can, as you can see below. The B pass was like a dot, the dot example.com. And when I put that, it just redirects me to my own website, the attacker controlled website, and it leaks the user access token. So basically, I can just give uh, uh, send the link to the user when they click on it while authenticated, it can leak their access token. That was an account takeover on three different uh, services because, as you can see in the use case parameter, it says entertainment. That's just one service. There are two other services that I can take over with this part. And I found it thanks to JavaScript files. All right, uh, one thing that I also love to do is like enumerating HTTP parameters and request headers. Like we've, when I've got this, when I've got hacking on an app and I've got this endpoint, I don't have any information about it. I just like use Paraminer to find all the hidden parameters, all the hidden headers. I managed to uh, like once I managed to find this header x4 x uh, dash forward four, and it was vulnerable to SQL injection. I found it using Paraminer. Uh, there was a time when I, found, uh, when I found a parameter, it was URL something, I was vulnerable to SSRF, thanks to Paraminer. So I always recommend like, uh, looking and enumerating these hidden parameters and uh, headers. Or I use the Go tool by Corbin, it's very amazing. It just uh, features uh, all URLs from uh, the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive. So when you're hacking on an app, you want to know all the available endpoints. And uh, using GoTool is really helpful because you get all these endpoints that were indexed at some point in time. And uh, as you can see in this screenshot there. <coughs> Another thing that I love to do when I do reconnaissance is continuously monitor the JavaScript changes. Because these JavaScript, they always change. The developers, they always modify them. They always add new endpoints. If they're working on a new feature, they add the endpoint to the JavaScript. Even if it's not visible on the app itself, they might have the endpoint in JavaScript. So in the future, they're going to implement it. So I always continuously monitor these changes. Uh, I helped develop. I was a contributor to develop JSMON. It's a tool that you can use to monitor these JavaScript when there are changes, as you can see in the screenshot. You get a ping on Telegram, for example, and you can see the difference. Uh, let's talk about manual security testing. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are obsessed with automation. Everyone is just talking about automation. Hey, I'm building this automation machine. I'm automating this and this and that. But like, everyone is just skipping the cr most important part, which is the creative and the manual testing, which pays way more in the long term. And also, like, uh, a lot of people just do, and they do this all of this automation, but they skip the core application. And a lot of the times, companies are more interested in finding security vulnerabilities in the core application other than their subdomains. They don't, they don't care about that. But the core app pays a lot more. This is an example from Dropbox. Uh, it says here, this is the bounty table only for the core app. Everything else, this bounty table doesn't apply to it. And this is a really good, decent bounty amount if you're hacking on their core app. <coughs> so functionality or feature-oriented testing. A lot of people, when they start testing, they go with the assumption, hey, I'm going to look for XSS. Hey, I'm going to look for uh, SSRF. And then they start like looking for a certain class of vulnerability, whereas my methodology is like just test every functionality. Like I've got, for example, this up, uh, uploader or Im image uploader. And I think, what kind of bugs will apply to this functionality? Uh, if you're testing a webhook, for example, what, what, what kind of bugs you might be testing for? You might want to test for SSRF, right? So that's how I go about it. Which ki what kind of bugs that would apply to this functionality where, uh, in, instead of actually going and looking for certain class of vulnerability? Focused manual testing, it requires deep understanding of the inner working of the app. When you're hacking on an app, you want to spend a lot of time just understanding it, understanding how it works, reading the documentation, uh, uh, clicking the boxes, cl send, submitting the forms and everything so you can understand how everything is 
connected, especially when you're hacking on a big app and everything is just interconnected. So you want to spend a lot of time just understanding it. And always be ready to go the distance. Like when you have an app that has a paid plan, you want to pay that plan because you know there are so many features behind, behind the pro plans. So you want to go the distance and actually invest some money so you can be ahead of the competition. You, you wanna, if they have an SSO, you want to configure it. Because it I, mean, I know it will take time to set up, set up everything. And that what's going to make the difference between you and the regular bug hunter when they send SSO. Or like, oh, I'm not going to go and set up this. It's going to take time. And that's what ma makes the difference. Or if you, they have a hardware device, go ahead and order it. Get it and start testing it. All right, let me showcase uh, a bug where I found an account takeover. This required like understanding the app. So this was on a three-year-old three -year program, very old. I did not expect to find this. And I was hacking on this program for a while. I didn't find this. But it took time because I needed to actually understand how it works. So I was looking at their authentications, uh, authentication, and I tried to catch everything, just write down everything so it can have it in front of me. So what I noticed is that when the user navigates to the login page, they get redirected to this endpoint here in the second step. The OAuth flow start, is started. And when they enter their email address and password, they get, oh, by the way, in the second step, you can notice the correlation, correlation ID. So I noticed that one. I was like, what is this for? So when the user is logs in, uh, the, the correlation ID is used uh, in this endpoint, the, the login callback, and like, when the user logs in, the correlation ID gets authenticated. And the correlation ID is used to return the authorization code. And I was like, mm, how, can I, how can I go about hacking this one? So what I thought about is that what if I generate my own login uh, link, as you can see in the first step, and I send it to the victim, right? And, and I. Like I have my correlation, my own correlation ID, because I generated that link, and I send it to the user. When the user logs into their account, I quickly hit the OAuth uh, endpoint, like I do a ra it's sort of race condition, so I can beat the other user to consuming the correlation ID, because I generated it, and the user authenticated it, so I can use the correlation ID, which I have, to actually get their authorization code. But the second step, I had to automate it. I had to start a loop using Python or whatever, so I can keep hitting the, that endpoint and wait for, wait for the user to authenticate. And that was an ETO, and they paid 20K for it. This is the second bug, because I, I mentioned earlier, you should always have to like, uh, be ready to go the distance. The, so, this bug that we found, it required setting up the SSO. So basically, the SSO is also behind the pro feature. So basically, I have to buy the pro plan, and then I have to go through all the documentation so I can set up the SSO. And that what made the difference. This bug was, was there for a very long time, but I don't think people took the time to actually pay for that plan or just like set up the SSO. And it was very simple, super easy. So what happened is just I would just add the victim's email to my own Okta, my, the, S, the EDP. And uh, what happened next is that I tried to log in. Use it, uh, I set up the SSO on the target app, and I tried to log in to Okta with the victim's email. So basically, I added the victim's email to my SSO, and I log into my own SSO, and I log in with the victim's email, and that, that caused the, some identity conflict, which led to the application letting us the, the, the victim's account. And that was a very impactful bug. We got paid 55K for it with OXCB Andre. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. So that was a really good bug. And here we have a third bug. What made the difference, how I found this bug, is that, first of all, I had to read the documentation. It was a very complicated documentation. And there is another step that was very hidden in documentation. It says that if you want to activate or enable this API, you need to create a separate user account and explicitly assign the API permission to that user account. A lot of people missed that. They didn't, either did not read the documentation or they did not understand that step. So once you do that, you can construct the, the HTTP request and then 
you can actually be past it. The, the pass, there was some sort of validation, but I was able to be past it using a typical B pass. I used the EPV6 format. This was the B pass, and I was able to hit the internal uh, internal network, and that was a good SSRF uh, that got paid 30k. So as I mentioned earlier, it's just like always be ready to go the distance, read the documentation, don't be lazy, just do everything as instructed. Also, let's talk about automation. Uh, a lot of people talk about automation, but there, there are different aspects to it. Uh, like there, when we talk about automation, we talk about automating the recon or the content disco discovery, the first phase. We can also talk about automating the vulnerability discovery, right? Uh, we also talk about automating changes, monitoring, like monitoring changes, you can automate that. Or there is like some sort of automation where you just automate like the boring stuff, the boring tasks, right? So when we talk about automation, there are very different aspects to it. These are some tools that you can use for uh, each of those uh, steps uh, of automation or aspects automation. There are so many tools out there. It's crazy. It's very overwhelming that you might actually just get confused or lost. Uh, but if you want to build your own automation, I, I think automation is good. Like when it helps when you just collect data as a starting point, so you can start doing manual testing. I'm not against automation. I'm building it myself, but you just have to know how to use automation. This is how you can build like a basic automation flow. This is a basic one. Uh, first thing that you might want to do is just you load in the scope. Like you can use the BB scope uh, tool. You load the scope from all the uh, platforms, the backmatic platforms. So you have the scope, all the target companies. And you start the in subdomain enumeration. You can use EMAS, subfinder, sublister. I use EMAS, works very well. And then the second, third step, this one, a lot of people they skip it, is permutation. So when you have this list of subdomains that you gathered, you can do the permutation technique where you permutate the words in the subdomain. Like you have this subdomain called, for example, admin.example.com. Uh, you can do permutation like admin-panel, uh, admin-test. This is the permutation. This one actually helps a lot. Uh, someone wrote an article about it where, uh, where they confirmed or they proved that it, it might add like up to 20% results to your recon. And then you do some DNS resolution so it can get rid of all the hosts that are not alive. Or then you do some DNS enumeration, find all those DNS uh, information, which you can, for example, get the A records and then you port scan everything. I use an in-map. I'm a, I'm a very classic, very traditional, but works very well. Uh, and then the last step is the vulnerability scanning. That when you got all the information, you can just start the vulnerability scanning. This is this is sim simple reconnaissance flow that you might want to implement, which I did myself with a good friend of mine. So earlier uh, this year, we started like building some automation. Uh, so because we want to monitor changes, we want to monitor. Uh, just catch the low-hanging fruit. We don't want to spend time looking for that, so we want to build automation that will help do that and just give us data to act on and start our manual testing. So we built a fully-fledged automation with app. We called it ReControl. I built it with a good friend of mine called Meluk. Uh, our stack was very simple. We used Python. We used Django framework, which helped a lot. We used Luigi for task orchestrations and Bootstrap for the front end. We use Postgres for database. Uh, we use a lot of open source tools like Inmap, Emas, HTTPX, Nucle. So this is how it looks. Like We can add uh, assets to the scope. We can edit it. We have like this. I, I'm, this is an example where we monitor subdomain takeovers. So we, we get these AWS bucket takeovers. We use Nucle templates as well, and that works a lot. Like we got so many subdomain takeovers using the uh, automations. And this is how the dashboard looks. We get an, uh, we can see everything like from the dashboard, how many assets, how we scan so far, total vulnerabilities. Total vulnerabilities, there are so many informatives there because we haven't filtered out everything, and the scheduled tasks and stuff like that. Automation. There are so many open source tools, as I mentioned, that you can actually get confused, easily overwhelmed. So you have, you, you need to pick the right tools, right? Don't be lost between trying this tool and then jumping to this tool and that, and just wasting a lot of your time. And automation it should be complementary. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to make big bounties, you have to focus on the main app, on the core app. And automation should only complement your, uh, your testing, like it gives you a starting point or just data to act upon. 
uh, efficient automation should always yield like a actionable information. If your automation is wasting your time, is like giving you a lot of false positives and wasting your time, I don't think it's worth it because you could have used that time actually hacking on the core app. So make sure automation is always like uh, gives you uh, good info. Uh, the challenge is task or orchestrations. As I mentioned, a lot of people here uh, do automations in a broken way. They have a bunch of bash scripts. If one tool breaks, every the whole flow just breaks. So you want to like f figure out a way to orchestrate everything. We for our automation we used Luigi for example. As I, I recommend it. It was developed by Spotify. And also the challenge is how to uh, distribute the load across multiple services. Uh, some bug hunters they use Kubernetes, which is pretty complicated to, to, to set up, but it's worth it. Some people they use Fleet or Axiom. These are open source tools that are used very widely by bug hunters. Most bug bounty automation only catch low-hanging fru fruits, which is true. Uh, it might result in duplicates, or so you might want to step up your automation. And there are so many automation frameworks, you don't even need to build it, unless you really have to. Like there is the Os Osmidus, there is a recon for the win. I really recommend this one. There is Osmidus, Reengine, Axiom. So basically, you don't have to build it yourself. These automation frameworks, they have everything covered. So you can just use those. Nucle is an amazing tool. I love Nucle. Uh, props to Project Discovery for building it. But what I've noticed is that a lot of people just use Nucle blindly. They just use the same public templates as everyone else. So everyone is just getting duplicates and just getting frustrated. If you can use Nucle in an efficient way, like do your own research, build your own templates, that would work a lot better than actually just running it on public programs like everyone else. All right, let's talk about security impact. I have two screenshots here. Uh, one that just says a typical pop-up XSS, and the one that actually managed to hijack the user session. Which one do you think will get a bigger bounty? It's obvious that the, 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 the one in the top, right? Because I managed to show impact, whereas the other one is just like, oh, I found this XSS. OK, what can you do with it? So you always want to show impact to the program, always try to maximize the impact. So for example, the session token, I could not leak it because there was an HTTP only flag. But when I was, I was, I was determined to increase the impact. So I was looking at the app, and I was looking at the source code. And there was an end point where the user session was in the source code. Why? I don't know. And that actually helped be past the HTTP only because I can just use my XSS to fetch, to fetch it from the source code. Uh, so I wanted to talk about security impact. Back bounty is not a traditional pen test. You're not supposed to submit uh, informative bugs without any security impact. In back bounty, you need to show impact. If you, your bug doesn't have any impact, don't even bother submitting it because it's just going to result in a lot of frustration. So you always want to maximize impact. Always ask this question, what can I do with this bug? I've got this bug. What can I do with it as an attacker? How can I use it against the, app, uh, the company's users? And then most of the companies, they pay out based on CVSS. And that's why I mentioned earlier, it's important to understand CVSS so you can try to maximize each component of it. Like confidentiality, make sure you hit that. Uh, integrity, make sure your bug can actually lead to manipulating user data, availability as well. So understanding of CVSS is very important. Think out of the box, always come with ideas on how you can escalate your bugs. There are always so many creative ideas to, uh, to go about your, your bug and how you can escalate it. So just think out of the box as a hacker. And also, when you've got some low-hanging fruits, like you find an open redirect, find cookie injection, uh, access without security impact, myself, I usually just save that. I just save it for a later use. I know some people might beat me to submit it, but like some people might skip it. So I, I always note down these low-hanging fruits because I know at some point in the future I might chin it with something to increase the impact. Say you have an open redirect, you could use it for an SSRF. That's critical. You could use it to leak the OAuth credentials. As I mentioned earlier in, my, in the, the bug where I used an open redirect to leak the access token. If I submitted the open redirect just like that, it would just get low, maybe get paid 100 bucks. Whereas I used it for, to leak the OAuth credentials and I got paid the maximum. So make sure you abide the, by the program rules. I know you want to maximize your impact, but sometimes you might get carried away and just go and start pivoting in their internal network. And that might be a deal breaker. So always make sure to read the rules and before you start escalating, don't execute dangerous commands when you get an RC and you start 
removing stuff and deleting stuff or changing stuff, don't do that. Or accessing other user data, always use your own testing accounts when you do that. Code review and security research. Uh, we were always told that to start hacking, you don't need to code, right? You don't need to read code. It's useless. You can just do everything in black box. I started myself. I, I didn't code. I didn't know how to code or anything. I did, I did very well. I did well. But I realized at some point in the future that actually understanding code, writing code, reading it is very important. I realized that it's, a cr it's very crucial if you want to stay relevant in back bounties. You might always go uh, about testing like in a black box approach, but we, when you can actually read code, you're likely to find a lot more bugs than the others. That will give you an edge, a uh, competitive edge. So I think writing and reading code is very important if you want to step up your game. Even like a lot of bugs, client-side bugs, when you read JavaScript, it requires you to understand the code. You, when, you're reading, when you're looking for post message uh, bugs in, the client, uh, in JavaScript, you need to understand how JavaScript works, right? So that's very important. Or just like a DOM exercise, that requires a certain um, understanding of code. And like also, as I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, bug hunting methodologies is just like finding zero-day vulnerabilities. So when you know how to code or we know how to read code, you're more likely to find bugs in third-party software, and you can use those zero-day to actually find them on back bounty programs. So I think coding is actually very important. And for back bounties, when you're uh, looking for zero-day vulnerabilities, I always advise people to look for pre-authenticated and un unauthenticated vulnerabilities. Because like in back bounty, uh, you don't have, you, you cannot authenticate to their own service. You can always like, demonstrate impacts from the outside. So if you've got O days, unauthenticated O days, that's, that's even m more maximum impact. Where you have, w whereas if you have an authenticated O day, how can you go about it? Just tell the program, hey, you can log into your account and start uploading this web shell. Doesn't work. So always look for unauthenticated and, or pre authenticated. Also, another thing when you do code review is like monitoring for new CVEs. CVEs. A lot of uh, vulnerabilities, they get assigned CVEs. So what I do myself is I like to monitor the new CVEs, like when there is a new vulnerability, a zero-day vulnerability that gets published. Uh, I use Attacker KB. I love this project. They, they have technical analysis for all the, a, a lot of zero-day vulnerabilities. They have, I find exploits here and POCs. They talk about all the technical analysis of the vulnerability. So I highly recommend Attacker KB. These are some resources you can use if you want to learn code review. Uh, you have the, so you want to be a web security research article by James Kittle, very good one. Uh, Asset Note, Blog Security Advisories, they publish a lot of their zero-day vulnerabilities. Really amazing write-ups, and you can use OWASP code review, Pinterest lab code review exercise as well. Or there is, if you want to willing to pay money, you can go for uh, the advanced web attacks and exploitation. I've ha I've heard good feedback about it. I've started it recently as well. Uh, so yeah, and collaboration, collaboration is very very new. I'll, I, we've, we started talking about collaboration a lot lately, and. Me, uh, like some of the best and most impactful bugs that I've seen were actually a result of collaboration between a team or just uh, uh, bug hunters. So when you're collaborating, it's just like everyone brings a different skill set. If you, this guy is good at reverse engineering, this guy is good at some certain skill. So when you like combine everything, it's just very powerful. Um, and even bug bounty platforms, they realize that collaboration is actually. Uh, very powerful, and they started implementing features to support it. For example, on HackerOne, if you have a report, you can invite someone to your report, a collaborator as they call it. They started building bounty split. So if you get a, if you're two people found same vulnerability, you can split the bounty automatically. And they started giving best collaboration awards at live hacking events. So they realized that collaboration is very powerful, and I, I've seen it myself. Some of the best bugs always uh, were a result of collaboration. So. If you're, always, if, if you're ever like stuck somewhere, you could not escalate the vulnerability, find someone who is relevant, someone who has the knowledge. You can find these people. There are so many open communities where you can meet other bug hunters, where you can actually share leads and collaborate. There's like the uh, bug bounty world Slack community. There is Nahamsik uh, Discord community. There is HackerOne Discord community. So you can meet a lot of people there. So if you've got, if you are stuck somewhere, you could not escalate a bug or something. You could just hit someone up and start working together. But always 
have, you have to set expectations up front. Because collaboration, there is a lot of frustration that may originate from it. Like people, for example, they're not agreeing on the bounty amount, so you have to always agree on the bounty split. If I'm collaborating with you, we would have to agree on the bounty split. Am I getting 50-50 or 50 uh, or 70-20? Uh, so we have to agree on that. And also agree on some uh, conditions, like how, how do you go about sharing the research? Suppose you have a research together, the other guy might just go and share it with someone else. So you have to set expectations up front so you, don't, so you avoid complications and frustrations that might arise. Okay, so this is a DM I received from someone on Twitter. They were like, uh, they were like hey, bro, I've got this SSRF. I could only hit external websites. He hit me on Twitter. And he was like, hey, do you want to collab? And what I liked about it is that he, he was setting expectations up front. He was like, well, I'll, I will share 50-50 bounty if I can manage to escalate it. I was like, OK, I'm down to give it a try. All right? So basically, it was a P4 bug. P4 means the low, because he was only able to hit external websites. Right? He couldn't, he couldn't hit any internal endpoints. So I give it a try. This, is, was, a, this was an old CVE. So basically, this is the HTTP request. And the URL is the vulnerable parameter. So when you put an external website, maybe a burp collaborator, you get a hit, you get a ping, right? That's all he could do. That's all he, he could do with it. I was, so I gave it a try. First thing I did, I don't know how he missed this one. This is the most typical one. It's like, dude, just put the local host and point it to 80 port. And I got welcome to Engi Nginx. But that was, that was like P4, that may be P P3, right? But we want to maximize the impact even more. This is, this is really nothing because I don't have any impact. OK, I know that you have Nginx internally, so what? So what I tried next, I tried to hit the EWS uh, metadata endpoint because they were using EWS. So first thing I thought about is like I could exfiltrate security credentials, but that did not work because uh, I was getting 401 unauthorized. It didn't make any sense, right? So I started reading about EWS metadata endpoint, and I came to realize that they have two different versions. If you're, if you're familiar with the EWS metadata endpoint, there is the first version. is when you just send a GET request, and you get the information back. No authentication required. But this target here was using the second version. And the second version requires that you submit a certain header and get a, an authentication token, and use the authentication token, to actually exfiltrate the security credentials. It's like a two-step thing, and I need to control the headers when I do the SSRF. I need to. That was a challenge. I kept reading and reading, and I, I came to know that these, this app is actually using Atlassian Gadget that uses the Google Gadget API. So the Google Gadget API, they have other parameters that were load, like the HTTP method, the post data, and the headers. So basically, I can control the post data, I can control the headers, and I even can control the method that, I, that I, I, I sent to internal network. So I did that. I hit the metadata endpoint, and I managed to exfiltrate the authentication token. And I used that authentication token to send another request. Uh, it was a post request, if I remember. Yeah, it was a post request. I used the, auto the metadata token that I exfiltrated earlier, and I managed to get the AWS security credentials. And we managed to escalate it from a P4 to a P1. And this one got paid as a maximum, as a critical. So collaboration is very important. And that guy, if he submitted it as a P4, he would have got paid very less. But now as a P1, even if we split it, it's still a good bounty. So that proves the power of collaboration. This is something we used to do in, way back in 2016. We used to gather a bunch of bug hunters, and we started a spreadsheet. This was back in 2016 with Mark Litchfield, a lot of good hunters, and we would see the goal. Like for this one, it was like, hey, we want to hit 300K. I think, I don't remember, but it was like in three months. So everyone was just like, if you get a bounty, you just add the number, how many bounty you, you found. If it's a public program, you can just put it there. If it's a private, just put it in the private bounty column. So this is some sort of friendly competition just to push each other to, to just like encourage and motivate each other to find bugs. And it actually worked. It worked. They, but we did not hit the goal. I guess a lot of people were busy back then. But we made like 100K. Uh, same with uh, some friends of mine. We did the same, like me and my friend Ayub and Geek Boy Sandeep. 
we did this in April 2016. So what I'm saying is just you want to collaborate and always have this uh, friendly competition between each other. So you can push each other, of course. And uh, this is something I had with Nahamsik on Twitter. It was a public, uh, a public feud with Nahamsik, and it was just, it was just like we were like giving each other some hard time on Twitter. But it was like a friendly competition, right? It was just like pushing each other so that we can climb that ladder, we can go on the leaderboard. So it was like always changing my bio. Hey, Nahamsik, is it getting cold down there? <laughs> it was a very friendly competition. I don't know if you guys remember. But what I'm saying is just that uh, always collaborate, always like uh, uh, do some com uh, friendly competition with your friends so you can push each other. Uh, last words, bug hunting is, a, is, a, is not a race, it's a marathon. It requires consistency, always like f looking for bugs, it requires persistence. Like some of the best chains that I've had, it took me a year maximum, so uh, like just collecting every piece. So it requires a lot of persistence and it requires patience. Bug bounty really, you need to be patient. Even like looking for bugs or get, waiting to get paid or just waiting to get a response. So these are very, like three very important values that every bug hunter should have. Uh, also, take as many notes as you can. This is very important. A lot of people, they spin up Burp Suite, a temporary project. Once they finish testing, they just close it. Everything is lost. Why? I love taking notes. It helps me a lot. It, I, because like those notes, you can always go back to them and just like, oh, you might have missed something, right? So like always take notes. I, I use, uh, what is it called, Notion for myself. Some people use GitHub repositories to note everything. It doesn't matter as long as you just uh, keep taking notes. And keep learning, keep acquiring knowledge because it's important. You don't want to be stagnant. Keep diversifying your skill sets. You can always have this competitive edge over others. Someone who is only good at web app, uh, and someone who is good at web app and also hardware testing will have more competitive advantage. And also, bug bounty can easily drain your mental health because, like, it might take a toll on your mental health because it's very difficult. Like, you spend so much time in front of your laptop looking for bugs, and at the end of the day, you might not find anything at all. That is very frustrating. So that's why you want to take care of your mental health. Like, always balance things out and. Make sure to enjoy the journey. Just don't go hard on yourself. It's supposed to be a lot of fun, right? So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Which way is the best to learn vulnerability? By books or by research? Uh, sorry, can you see again? Can you hold it a little bit closer? Which way is the best way to learn vulnerabilities? Like uh, books? or uh, tweets or something. Oh, okay. So if you want to learn about vulnerabilities, I, I suggest books, yeah. But like the best way actually is to read other people's disclosures. Like when you go on the Hacker Run platform, for example, you can find so many disclosed bugs. That way you know what kind of bugs that companies are interested in. Uh, what kind of bugs do you want you to look for? So I, I read people's disclosures. I also love reading other people's write-ups. So there are so many bug bounty write-ups uh, publishing vulnerabilities that people found, so you can also use that. And I recommend, the, for, for books, I recommend the Web Applications Hacker's Handbook. That is a good starting point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Okay, just one more question. I have, I have, an, I have okay, one Okay, just quickly. So uh, actually, I'm also working on similar automation product, like which you have mentioned. Yeah. So my question is, like, uh, while scanning multiple assets, we have uh, a lot of data. Like, uh, so I am using NoSQL database, MongoDB. Uh, so my question is like, uh, like for example, if we're scanning the entire, not entire internet, like at least the bug bounty targets as well. So we have multiple subdomains and a lot of IPs. Mm -hmm. So how concurrently like uh, do you uh, rescan the assets and do you keep the results to differentiate between the past? Can you, can you repeat the last part? Uh, do you keep the results of the past scan and the new scans and uh, multiple scan results to compare the results? Or like, uh, if if you're doing that, like, how do you maintain a lot of data? Like, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, according to me, uh, when I was uh, making the product, so what I felt is like database is the only cost which is uh, which is like uh, a major cost in this. Uh, mm. That makes sense. Uh, for us, for example, uh, we only keep like the the like the last recent change, we don't keep track of all the changes because as you mentioned, that would be a lot of workload on the database. And also like storing data is not a problem for us. We use Postgres, we highly recommend it. It's very scalable, so that's not a problem at all, yeah. 
So the question is like, uh, do you only use Postgres or like there, is there any specific reason why you use, why you choose SQLite database only, like not, not no SQL? Uh, not, like no particular reason, we just really liked Postgres and we had a previous experience working with it and we knew that it's very scalable, there are so many resources online if we get stuck or anything, like that. Postgres has like a huge community. So no particular reason, I think you can use any data, even MySQL, you can use that, it works. A lot of companies, they could scale their MySQL database. So the choice of database is not important, actually. It's irrelevant, yeah. Uh, actually, I have uh, moved a lot of, like, uh, in past, like, I, when I was starting this product, so I was first chose the MongoDB, then I moved to PostgreSQL, then I again moved to MongoDB, because, like, uh, what I felt, like, uh, I have read a lot of articles, like, when it comes to PostgreSQL, there is a scalability issues uh, when we go with a lot of data. Like, we need to do sharding, and we need to mm. create multiple instances of, uh, PostgreSQL, but in MongoDB, like uh, it's a NoSQL database, so it scales uh, uh -huh. seamlessly. So that's okay. why I was concerned about your. Uh, like okay, that makes sense. I think for us, like because we only use that automation for big bounties, we we don't have to care about sharding or anything because we don't have that much that much data that would make a difference actually. So yeah, it doesn't make any difference for us. So we just use Postgres. Yeah. So one last question, like, uh, are you making uh, the product which uh, you mentioned, vcontroller.io, I think? Uh, you can you say again? Just two minutes. Sorry, minute. no, sorry, we have to already asked ah. you questions. We'll talk later. We are already right. running. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ayasin. Oh.